our amazing keynote this morning. We have uh, uh, such a privilege to have this speaker um, talking to you guys. Uh, and the keynote is about what's in a jailbreak, hacking the iPhone 2014 to 2019 onwards uh, with Mark Dowd. And a lot of you probably have heard of Mark Dowd, but Mark Dowd is an expert in application security, specialising primarily in low-level operating system vulnerability research for both desktops and popular mobile devices. He is currently the director of Azimuth Security, now L3 Trenchant, a security company he founded that specialises in code review and cutting edge security research. Prior to starting Azimuth, his professional experience includes several years as a senior researcher at a Fortune 500 company where he uncovered a variety of major vulnerabilities in ubiquitous internet software. He's also worked as a principal security architect for McAfee, where he was responsible for internal code audits, secure programming classes, and undertaking new security initiatives. Mark has also co-authored a book, a very, very well-known book, actually, on the subject of application security named The Art of Software Security Assessment, and has spoken at several industry-recognised conferences. This buyer really doesn't give him uh, justice, uh, but can we please welcome Mark Dowd to the stage? Thanks. Hi, thanks, uh, Silvio. Um, so, as uh, Silvio mentioned, my name's Mark Dowd. I'm going to be talking about what's in a jailbreak. And uh, essentially, uh, in this talk, I want to basically go through the components that make up a typical uh, jailbreak. Um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, browser-based remote jailbreaks. Uh, in the in the inter, in the uh, abstract, I wanted to also I mentioned that I was also going to go through USB-based ones, but I quickly realized that that was going to take two and a half hours if I did that. So um, I'm basically going to have to do two talks, I suppose. Um, Silvio introduced me already, so I don't need to go through this. I would like to point out that I've rescued several uh, people from Apple, though, uh, so that um, they, they've uh, been a great help for putting this speech together. Um, so the reason I wanted to talk about iPhone jailbreaking is um, you hear a lot about it. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, jailbreaks are released to great fanfare, and um, also you see Zerodium bounties, and they're offering millions of dollars for a, for a complete iPhone jailbreak. And um, for people that are not as familiar with, uh, uh, with how jailbreaks work, um, this seems like a crazy amount of, of money and fanfare. Um, but uh, I basically want to show that it's... Uh, it's actually pretty difficult. Um, so uh, when we talk about iOS jailbreaking, we're talking about the re removing of software and strict restrictions imposed by iOS, which is Apple's operating system, on devices running it through the use of software uh, exploits. And it's always been quite difficult, but over the past five years and in the past uh, two years in particular, it's, um, they've raised the bar quite significantly. So. In order to, to, in order to uh, talk about um, uh, the anatomy of a jailbreak, I sort of have to um, cover a little bit about the uh, iPhone security model in general. Um, this is a topic that's sort of been covered a lot in the past. Uh, however, um, if, if you're a bit unfamiliar with it, then a lot of the anatomy of a jailbreak wouldn't make much sense. Uh, after that, I'm going to go through a practical example, which was the Pegasus jailbreak found in the wild. Uh, and then um, the post-Pegasus world, uh, uh, which, uh, so Pegasus was found in iOS 9, and this is, uh, I don't know why this is going <laughs> without me, um, uh, going from iOS to iOS 12. So we start off with the uh, Apple security model. Um, basically, I've identified uh, th uh, the elements that I consider core to Apple's security model, which is code integrity, uh, isolation, exploit mitigations, and something that I've called environment preservation. Um, encryption uh, and uh, strong encryption and data privacy is also a large part of iPhone security, uh, but it's not really relevant to remote jailbreaks. It's more relevant to the USB style attacks, um, and so I'm not really going to cover that here, but anyone that's interested should go and read Ivan Kerstick's talk, which is uh, really excellent and covers it in great depth. So with code integrity, uh, basically, the idea with the iPhone ecosystem is that only Apple-approved code is ever run on the system. Um, and this is uh, quite, a, quite an impressive feat, really. And to achieve it, they, they do a multi-pronged approach. Um, they have a trusted boot chain, because if, you're, if you can't basically trust your kernel or anything below it, then you can't really trust the rest of the operating system at all. 
Um, and then following that, they have user mode integrity. Essentially, every single application that's run on an iPhone is signed by Apple. Um, and, uh, and then uh, there's runtime integrity, which is some additional um, security, uh, se security features about the uh, iPhone iOS runtime. Um, so with boot integrity, this is a simplified version of, of what an iPhone, uh, what the iPhone boot chain looks like. I say simplified because it doesn't account for some of the things that, again, are more relevant to USB, such as the SEPROM, SEP, um, and booting to DFU or recovery mode. But for basically booting to iOS, you have a ROM, um, which has the, establishes a root of trust with Apple's certificate. Um, because it's immutable, they can embed their certificate, um, and they can know it's trusted. And then each additional stage up until you load the iOS kernel, uh, each additional stage cryptographically uh, verifies the stage before it, so that um, uh, each stage uh, can, be, can be validated that it hasn't been modified by anyone. Um, user mode integrity, like I said, all user mode binaries are signed by Apple, um, and by that essentially we mean all binaries contain a code signature uh, that is cryptographically verified by the kernel or by a user mode service called AMFID, uh, which is trusted by Apple. The code signature essentially contains information about the executable, um, and uh, most importantly, a list of hashes about every page from the binary that's, that gets mapped in, um, and, uh, and then also entitlements granted to that binary, which is something that we'll be discussing later. Um, so we have uh, uh, two methods for verifying binaries. Um, uh, now, the mechanics of how this works is not really important for this talk, so um, I'm not really going to talk about it here, uh, but essentially I wanted to put it on the slide deck for people that are interested in following that up. Um, so after that, we have uh, runtime integrity. So basically, if you could just uh, map read-write executable memory and execute whatever code you like, then uh, essentially having all the verification of the binaries and all that kind of thing is not very valuable. So the runtime integrity basically disallows read-write execute mappings. Um, uh, execute, executable code must belong to something with a valid code directory. Um, and then they've done some additional uh, runtime security checks uh, to prevent you from um, uh, uh, doing some other things at runtime. Uh, these were things that were introduced over time because of the result of jailbreaks. So the next thing we're talking about is isolation goals. So um, essentially, we want to uh, prevent, um, prevent uh, compromised applications from being able to adversely affect the system. So we want to sandbox them, reduce the attack surface, and um, enforce granular uh, control over, this, over system resources. So um, the, there's basically three factors that govern how a, a, an application is isolated. It depends on the user running the system. Um, it depends on the entitlements granted to that application. And it depends on the sandbox in restrictions imposed on it. Um, user is either root or mobile. iPhone is essentially a two-user Unix system. Um, most things run as mobile. Uh, a couple of things run as root, like system services. Um, entitlements are special privileges that are granted to the application. Uh, That'll, that allow them to do something that isn't allowed by the system or isn't allowed by that particular user. Um, entitlements are immutable, and they can't be modified at runtime. So the entitlements that are present in the code signature is what that application has, and that's it. So this is some examples of entitlements. And really, the, the, there's tons of them, but the only one that really matters for us in the context of web jailbreaks is dynamic code signing which is a special permission that allows you to map read-write executable memory once in the lifetime of a process. And specifically, the web browser does it uh, for um, dynamic generation of JIT code. Uh, lastly, we have um, isolation. So uh, obviously, um, uh, iOS has quite a robust sandbox. Um, nearly any resource that you want to access um, from the system uh, is the request is proxied through uh, the, sandbox, uh, the sandbox kernel extension, and um, it, it decides uh, what you're allowed to access, and that's based on a sandbox policy. Um, 
Most uh, app store apps have a standardized app profile that only allow them to access, you know, basically their container. Um, and system applications uh, typically have their own sandbox, uh, which is based on a built-in profile that's uh, bundled within iOS. Um, there's actually a really excellent talk about, uh, about sandboxing um, and the mechanics of it uh, by Jonathan Levin, which uh, I've put the link up to there. Um, so essentially, uh, entitlements, of, uh, sandboxing is something that restricts access that the user would normally have. And entitlements are something that permit access that the user or, or no one would normally have, such as being able to uh, map executable memory. Um, OK, so uh, obviously, um, like any contemporary operating system, um, iPhone has a, a, a gamut of exploit mitigations um, that have become increasingly uh, complicated over the, over, the, um, over the last few years. And the idea is to prevent them from being reliably exploitable, um, prevent vulnerabilities from being reliably exploitable. Uh, I've, I've sort of talked about before early stage mitigations, which are ones that uh, attempt to detect or obscure um, critical uh, data structures, uh, such as uh, heap or saved return address, um, uh, and or prevent basically you getting uh, code execution. Um, and uh, then there's late stage mitigations where you've com completely corrupted data control structures, but they want to try and prevent you from um, actually executing code. So you have things like control flow integrity, pack in this case, um, JIT hardening, uh, code signing, that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of, of them that are present in iOS, but these are the ones that are relevant for this talk. Um, firstly, KSLR. Uh, and ASLR is something you probably would have already heard of, address space randomization. In iOS, they basically slide binaries by a ran randomized amount. Um, the second thing is uh, kernel heap hardening. Um, uh, there's been multiple iterations of this uh, over the span of uh, iOS's lifetime. Um, and uh, they've done, uh, Stefan Esser has done multiple talks about this, but basically, there's zone isolation, which is essentially they create uh, isolated zones for like data structures so that you can't replace one data structure with another one by grooming memory. Um, there's uh, zone data structure hardening, essentially uh, encrypting, encoding things in memory. Um, there's block verification, which um, when you free a block, it makes sure that you're freeing it to the correct zone. Um, there's poisoning, where, where they... Uh, you know, will write junk over a, over a block so that uh, for use after free type vulnerabilities, uh, you can't exploit them. Um, and there's free list randomization. Uh, Safari has also done its own heap hardening. Um, again, it's got an isolation strategy and one that's called the Giga Cage most recently. Again, the idea of this is that um, uh, objects of certain types are segmented off from objects of other certain types in the heap. And so when you um, try and do a use after free or something, you can't um, replace a freed object with you know, uh, arbitrary data contents. You're restricted by, uh, you're restricted by um, only being able to replace it with other objects of the same type. Um, bulletproof JIT is another important uh, thing. Uh, this has had two main iterations. Um, in the A10 iPhones, they had a, an execute only bit, which means you could map pages that were executable but not readable. Um, and uh, the way, uh, what they did with the JIT mapping in Safari is to map it at two locations in memory, one that was executable only but not readable, and one that was writable but in a hidden location. And they would only refer to it in the in executable only pages. The idea was that even if you had um, full read and write access to memory, you couldn't really find out where the writable pages were, so you couldn't write arbitrary code into this region. Um, they switched that out in A11 for a different thing called fast permission switching, where um, they went back to one mapping for the JIT, but um, a, a special system register would control whether it was writable or executable, and um, they would basically enforce uh, access to the access to the JIT uh, through through one gate that only um, that switched that bit around depending on what they wanted to do. 
The last thing I, th I guess I want to talk about here is pointer authentication, which is something you probably would have heard a lot about. It was um, something added in uh, the ARM 8.3 A spec, and essentially uh, it uses um, some unused bits in 64-bit pointers uh, to take a more or less a hash of, of the pointer um, uh, encoded with another arbitrary piece of data that you can choose. And so l largely the idea was um, was that, uh, and they, they introduced this in the A12s, the new iPhones that came out uh, fairly recently in September. So the idea with uh, PAC is that um, you can't overwrite, um, uh, you know, do data point, uh, uh, do pointer overwrites because you won't know how to do the, um, how to do, how to do the correct hash and um, the hash will be invalid and uh, the pointer will basically be rendered invalid. So environment preservation is the last thing, and I think this is fairly, tip, uh, fairly uh, unique to, to Apple, actually. Um, this is basically, um, uh, we talked about a, you know, a protected runtime and um, where you know, we've protected the boot chain, we've protected the, the code that's running, only, uh, I, you know, only Apple things are running. Um, but uh, Apple has recently done something that, let's say you fully compromise the kernel, uh, in the past, obviously, if you compromise the kernel, you can execute kernel code that you want, you can execute user mode code that you want. So they've started uh, trying to limit the impact of, even if you fully compromise the kernel, to preserve the system integrity uh, to some degree. Um, and uh, there's, there's several protections that they've done in, in, the, uh, in, the attempt, in an attempt to do that. Um, the first one is uh, APFS remounting. So, the, the file system in the, the root file system in iOS that contains all the system binaries is uh, is mounted read only. Uh, usually, when you're um, putting down a payload or something, you want to uh, remount it with with write access, and this has typically never been especially difficult. You have to um, uh, modify some data structures in in memory in the kernel, but uh, once you get uh, kernel access, but um, but they never went out of their way to protect it. Um, but with the recent introduction of a new file system, APFS, they started using snapshotting, and they started um, also utilizing some of the other protections that I'm going to talk about shortly to um, try and protect the integrity of uh, the data structures describing uh, the mounts so that you couldn't uh, easily uh, remount the file system. Another really important late-stage mitigation is something called PMAP protected layer. Um, this is going to be something that's talked about a lot over the next year. Um, it's part of the, uh, the A12 iOS kernel, and it works in conjunction with PAC, which we already talked about. Uh, essentially, what PPL is, uh, is it isolates a certain amount of kernel memory um, and makes it uh, not, uh, not executable except through a certain trampoline. Um, uh, and also um, uh, protects some data so that it's not writable, even if you can write to other kernel memory. Uh, what, and then what they protect in this area is code th uh, that governs sensitive data structures, such as page tables um, and code, code signing information. Uh, the result of which is that um, even if you get kernel level access, if you don't have a PPL bypass, then it is, um, it is quite difficult to be able to uh, you know, inject executable code into user mode processes, modify entitlements and um, uh, and, uh, and signatures at runtime, and um, also uh, add to the trust cache in the kernel. Um, code signing is something you're probably already very familiar with. Um, again, it's been talked about at length, so I won't really cover that here. Um, and the last thing is uh, KTRR, which is the uh, successor to something called KPP. So KPP was an original kernel patch protection. It was a, a hypervisor-like technology that would um, uh, it, it infrequently, through execution of the kernel, would try to validate that the kernel hasn't been patched. Um, and if it found something that, it, that, uh, that was patched, then it would panic the kernel. They, they eventually abandoned this for something called uh, kernel text read-only region, which is a, a newish hardware mitigation. And essentially what this does is it just marks, uh, they, they mark an area of the kernel, uh, specifically with the kernel uh, text segment and um, executable code uh, uh, read-only after it's been mapped in initially, and um, you, you can't undo it. So essentially, even if you get uh, 
full read write access to kernel memory. Uh, if KTRR is active and you don't know how to bypass it, then um, you can't uh, patch kernel code directly. So that was a, a quick tour of uh, iPhone's security. Um, the, the takeaways as far as um, remote jailbreaks are concerned really um, is one thing is code integrity uh, and the other is controlling the hardware. So a big differentiator for Apple, I think, is code integrity. Um, basically, nearly all the code that's run on the system, with the exception of the, the JIT mapping thing that I talked about, uh, code is essentially whitelisted. All of it has been verified by Apple and um, uh, rather than blacklisting or just using code integrity for a small part of the system like a boot chain. Um, it's, it's very rigid and it's uh, quite mature now, whereas before, when they first implemented it, it was a little bit, um, it had a lot of weaknesses. Um, code integrity has been done before, of course, uh, for trusted boot chains and um, you know, signed ActiveX controls and things, but no one has really done it as completely as iOS in a commercial product. Um, Windows S is sort of uh, getting there, but not quite. The second differentiator is that Apple controls their, their hardware, their, their ecosystem. So they can enforce uh, security at the hardware level, and they're increasingly doing that. Um, you know, where, whereas someone like Microsoft might do CFG as a, as a control flow integrity thing, uh, Apple can just go straight to hardware um, and, and, you know, use PAC and things like that. And because they don't work with a committee or, or something like that, they can generally get hardware mitigations to market a lot more quickly than competitors. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of Android phones are likely going to have pack in the near future, but, um, you know, Apple will have beaten them by like six months to a year. Um, some of the protections that I've gone through, actually, you'll notice that most of the protections that I've gone through have been implemented in hardware to some degree, um, and that speaks to... Uh, speaks to uh, Apple's ongoing strategy. Um, hardware mitigations are often much more difficult to bypass. Uh, it sort of depends how complicated they are and how much the software side of it has to do. Um, but um, they can pro provide a much more uh, robust security mechanism. Um, there's a few gotchas, of course, with this, uh, with this approach. One is uh, you need the latest devices to get the latest mitigation benefits uh, pack. You need an A12. Uh, the iPhone XS and XR, um, otherwise you just don't have it. Um, and in theory, if you found a hardware level bug, it, they might not be able to work around it in software, and you essentially just have to wait until uh, the next device comes out. So that's a really quick introduction to iOS security. Um, now we're going to talk about what constitutes a jailbreak. So, Basically, in order to bypass this, we need a multitude of vulnerabilities into a chain. Um, and one of the difficulties of this is that any broken link in the chain might render the chain in partially or entirely useless. Um, so we're going to consider remote jailbreaks today. Um, like I said, uh, USB is a really interesting use case in particular and um, is worthy of its own talk, um, but I just didn't have time to fit it in. Um, there's also another kind of jailbreak, uh, a near access type one, where you deliver an exploit via baseband or via Wi-Fi. Um, Project Zero has done a really good example of that before. Um, but again, it would warrant its own talk. So the goals of our jailbreak are to compromise runtime integrity, be able to execute arbitrary code at runtime, and to compromise the bus trusted boot chain so that we can regain code execution after, after the phone has been rebooted. So basically, um, this is the template for what a typical jailbreak will look like. There's five real stages, um, uh, basically the five stages of grief. Um, firstly, uh, you want to compromise runtime integrity. So this, uh, this essentially involves getting a foothold in the system. Uh, in our case, it's going to be Safari. Um, but you could also get it through like a messaging app, an email client, you know, anything. The second stage is extending access, breaking out of a sandbox, uh, perhaps getting um, unsigned code execution. Uh, this is an optional step, uh, as we'll see. Uh, the third step is getting kernel access, so elevating your privileges to kernel um, and then getting complete control of the system. It's not really complete anymore because of PAC and PPL. Um, and then stage four, uh, once you've got 
kernel execution, you want to weaken all the security mitigations as much as you can, remove code signing, add the entitlements you need, inject into processes, whatever you, whatever you happen to be doing. Um, and then to compromise the boot chain, you basically want to place data on the system to, um, so that when the phone is rebooted, uh, your data is parsed or whatever it is you're using to get code execution. Each, each, uh, each chain is generally about three bugs uh, of, this, uh, of a, of a web-based web -based jailbreak. Um, some stages may not be required, but often stages require more than one bug. In particular, inf information leaking is often a separate bug. But typically, you'll have a Safari exploit, um, you'll have a kernel exploit, and either a code signing bypass or some kind of uh, boot time exploit. Sorry, I don't know why uh, PowerPoint keeps running ahead of me. Uh, uh, OK, so um, the first step is, um, you, like I said, you have a variety of potential vectors. The reason the browser is the most attractive target is because it, it's got so many things going for it uh, that are in the attacker's favor. It has a large attack surface. It has interaction with a, complex state, a number of complex state machines, the, the DOM, the JavaScript engine, CSS, et cetera. Um, you have the ability to groom memory easy, easily. You have a programmatic feedback with the JavaScript language. And most importantly for iOS, you, um, like I mentioned before, you have the run unsigned code entitlement which means uh, you don't need a code signing bypass once you corrupt critical data structures if you're able to write to the JIT. If you, if you target another thing such as uh, you know, a messaging app or an uh, or, or a email client or something that doesn't have this uh, entitlement, then there's a huge problem in that you corrupt data. There's several huge problems, really. One of them is um, that you don't have a programmatic interface. It's often harder to groom memory. But also, you won't have, uh, you'll have to bypass code signing, which might mean have, having to do everything in ROP. Um, and even ROP is, might not be an option with PAC on the A12s. Um, the second stage, like I said, it's optional. If you can't go directly to kernel, sometimes there'll be a sandbox escape stage uh, or a partial sandbox escape or something like it. After that, um, you want to escalate to achieve uh, kernel level access. Um, in in uh, jailbreak parlance, this is generally referred to as TFP0 or task for PID0. And essentially, that means you get access to the kernel task. So the kernel task is a mark port. Um, and uh, when you have access to kernel task, then basically you're able to read and write uh, to kernel memory arbitrarily, um, notwithstanding the protections that I mentioned earlier. Um, like I said, this used to imply code execution, but now it really doesn't. Um, the exposed kernel attack surface is very large, and uh, there's a lot of speeches on this, but um, essentially you, would, you might be attacking um, in, in kernel mark services, uh, system calls, or uh, IO kit drivers, to name a few things. Um, uh, and again, these are really restricted depending on what sandbox you're attacking from. Um, the next thing is post-exploitation. So once you've got TFP0, uh, largely what you want to do is, um, it depends on exactly what you're doing, but essentially you want to weaken security controls um, and install your persistence payload so that when the phone reboots, you're able to regain control of the phone. Um, uh, often, like I mentioned, this involves remounting the, file sys uh, the root file system with, uh, with write privileges. Um, so regaining code execution after reboot is actually really quite difficult um, because of the trust boot chain that we, uh, that we briefly mentioned before. Um, essentially, you have to uh, break the chain of trust somewhere. Um, now, es essentially, you can do this by perhaps uh, mal creating a, a malformed file system that gets parsed. You might be able to attack executable parsers, image share, image four parsers, which is a, a a format that Apple uses to um, pack uh, a lot of its data structures. Um, or you might be looking for a logic flaw, a weakness in their cryptographic implementation. Um, so I've sort of gone over like what options you have here. The, um, exploiting the boot ROM is something uh, that's uh, happened once before a long time ago with an exploit called 24kpone. Um, if you're able to exploit the boot ROM, it's pretty great because uh, 
it's a ROM, so the bug is ever present until they release a new device. Um, uh, in, in reality, though, it's actually very difficult to, um, to find a vulnerability in the boot ROM because it's very sparse. It does nearly nothing specifically because of the, the reason that they can't replace it. There's also been a number of iBoot exploits in the past. iBoot is, uh, is basically the thing that loads the iOS kernel. Um, uh, it has some similar advantages to boot ROM, um, but uh, it does have some mitigations in place, in particularly PAC on the A12. Um, and the attack surface is, is larger than the boot ROM, but it's still fairly slim pickings, and Apple has spent a lot of time working on it due to um, past jailbreaks. The next stage is attacking the kernel itself. Um, I feel this is a, a very difficult target to attack if you're going for a memory corruption type flaw, because um, basically the full scale of memory corruption mitigations are present. You have to contend with AS ASLR. You have to contend with PAC, perhaps. Um, uh, you know, heap hardening, all that kind of thing. And because you're not actually executing code yet, your ability to groom memory and perform race conditions and stuff is very low to non-existent. So it's, it's a very difficult uh, target. Option four is uh, attacking the user mode itself. Um, so basically, there's a couple of options here. Firstly, finding a, a, f a logic flaw in the code signing machinery. Um, Failing that, you could try and uh, find a memory corruption or similar flaw in an Apple binary that runs at startup, or you could replace an Apple binary that runs at startup um, uh, and exploit that. Um, it, again, it's difficult for memory corruption because you aren't actually executing code yet, so your ability to groom memory and things like that is quite limited. However, um, it's a bit less difficult from, than the kernel in that you might be able to do multiple tries and have it keep crashing until it works, essentially. Um, option four, by the way, is by far the most popular vector. Um, most jailbreaks uh, that you've heard of uh, do something in this category. Finding, finding a flaw in the code signing machinery is, is by far, in my opinion, the most desirable option. Uh, firstly, it's reliable. You don't have to worry about grooming memory and things like that. Um, it allows privilege escalation to be performed in, in native code. You don't have to worry about doing ROP or anything like that, which, again, is, uh, is um, you know, ROP is a very significant cost to the attacker. So being able to bypass that is really useful. And like we said, with PAC, your ability to do ROP might be uh, effectively mitigated anyway. Um, and then lastly, if you have a code signing bypass, you might be able to reuse it elsewhere in your chain such as if you were doing a zero-click option where you were attacking a mail client or something along those lines, um, and you could control critical data structures, you might be able to then launch your code signing attack and get unsigned code, and then you gain back one of the advantages that the web browser would traditionally have. Um, there's various uh, places to target uh, this kind of vulnerability, and in the past, we've sort of seen ones uh, attacking the kernel binary loader, the Marco loader, um, the dynamic loader, uh, you know, dial D in user mode, uh, which is usually responsible for loading libraries um, and also loading the shared cache. Um, uh, the code signing faulting in logic, which is, uh, exists within the kernel, or the um, Apple, mobile f uh, Apple mobile file integrity daemon, AMFID, which is uh, also responsible for um, uh, verifying um, and validating code signatures. So these are all attractive targets, and they've been, numer uh, they've been uh, exploited many, many times in the past. Um, I've put some examples up there, uh, one on iOS 9 by Pangu. Uh, they talk about in their presentation they uh, exploited a logic vulnerability in loading the shared cache. Um, the problem is, like I said, is these areas have been rather rig rigorously attacked and undergone a lot of scrutiny. Um, but so it's a lot more difficult target, but then again, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing there, and ENB approved that uh, with as recently as iOS 11. So now that we've um, sort of talked about the, the, five, the five typical stages, um, I wanted to look at, at, at the Pegasus jailbreak. This was um, caught in the wild and um, targeted a number of iOS versions, but basically iOS 9.3 was about current when it got found. Um, so uh, this was a 2016 jailbreak, and um, 
this guy, Max, did a really excellent write-up um, of this and, and a talk about it, which you can go and look at uh, more of the details about. But I just wanted to show you how uh, they follow the typical structure of the jailbreak, um, uh, like we talked about uh, in the previous section. So iOS was a tough target, but not quite as tough back then. So um, their first vulnerability was a, a JavaScript core exploit, um, exploiting the JavaScript engine, uh, a use after free uh, in uh, something called the marked buffer implement, uh, marked argument buffer implementation. Um, this was triggered by JavaScript, um, and there was limited heap protections they had to work around, but like uh, the JIT hardening, the bulletproof JIT didn't exist yet at the time, so they didn't need to worry about that. So they basically had th uh, three stages uh, uh, that they needed to accomplish. One was triggering the vulnerability, which, um, uh, again, Max has done a really comprehensive write-up, but essentially, um, when, defining, uh, when defining an object with a large amount of properties, there was a vulnerability, uh, there was a mistake in the marked argument buffer thing that would essentially cause it to fail to mark uh, some of the JavaScript objects that are in use. Um, uh, so that if a garbage collection happens, they would accidentally get freed, but you would still have a JavaScript variable pointing to them. Uh, so a use after free vulnerability, essentially. So they basically um, exploited this vulnerability um, and then had to, and, and then uh, had a stale reference to, to uh, you know, to a JavaScript object and. Um, they would then create a new object that basically reallocated that same amount of that same memory, but pointed to a different type of object. And using this type confusion, they were essentially able to um, then corrupt a uint32 array object. If you've looked at typed arrays in um, in JavaScript before, it's very common that you will corrupt an object such as this and then use it to sort of index the entire uh, process address space. After that, they would get um, arbitrary code execution using a, a very standard method. Um, uh, this basically what you do generally is create a new function, call it repeatedly so that dynamic code gets generated, it gets uh, pointed into the JIT region. Um, then you use your ASLR primitive to find you know, the JS function data structure in memory. Um, that will contain a pointer to the JIT code for this function. You can then write over that JIT code, um, and then you call the JavaScript function, essentially, and execute the code you wanted to. Uh, Pegasus went straight to kernel, so they didn't have a sandbox escape, so they got to skip stage two. Stage three, they um, had a pair of vulnerabilities. Uh, like I said, some stages require more than one vulnerability. In this case, they had a uh, both in a function called OS unserialized binary, they had an information leak to bypass uh, kernel ASLR, and they had a use after free exploit as well. They had to contend with various uh, heap hardening things, in particular internal uh, randomization of free lists and um, uh, block poisoning, uh, and of course, KASLR. So uh, to defeat KS. ASLR, essentially, like I said, they had a, a separate vulnerability, um, which allowed them to read excess uh, kernel memory uh, adjacent to, to a buffer that, uh, that they had allocated. Um, from doing that, they were able to get a V table, and from that, they were able to, like a V table pointer, and from that, they were able to calculate the, um, the, the slide that the kernel has been moved by. Um, so they know where the kernel is in memory. Um, Furthermore, uh, then they go and trigger the bug. Um, again, this was, in, a, in effect, not unlike the JavaScript vulnerability that they found in that um, they, were, they were able to essentially cause a use after free um, and uh, maintain a reference to a stale object that had been freed uh, and reallocated as something else. Um, in, in this particular instance, uh, uh, Basically, later on, this object will have a uh, have the retain function called on it, um, uh, which basically involves going through a, a V table. And um, so, by over overriding, um, by freeing the object, then overriding it with data that you can control, you can craft your own fake V table pointer and then kick off a ROP chain essentially, and uh, and you know get arbitrary code execution. Um, 
So once they did that, uh, in, in their case, they essentially installed a few ROP chains uh, in the kernel that allowed them to do D word reads and writes to kernel memory and also to perform an arbitrary kernel function call. Uh, the post-exploitation, um, they had to contend with uh, kernel patch protection. Like I said, this was KTRR's predecessor, and it worked uh, okay, but like I said, um, uh, it would infrequently um, uh, check the kernel, and so it was basically still possible to patch the kernel and then patch it back and avoid K uh, KPP to some extent. Uh, also, there were some publicly known uh, complete, uh, fairly complete bypasses of it. So their fourth stage, um, obviously they did a lot of um, implanting malware and stuff like that, but we're really only interested in weakening the kernel because that's what's relevant to our talk. So the first thing they do is um, instead of relying on their ROP chain any further, they get kernel task. Um, the way they do that is uh, they patch the code in the kernel temporarily, uh, uh, the task for PID um, function so that they could uh, p perform that and get kernel task back into their process. Um, they escalate their own process to root by doing another kernel uh, code patch on um, the set R E U I D system call. Um, they then would go and uh, basically neuter the um, sandbox uh, by modifying a, a, a policy that the sandbox installs, um, disable code signing, uh, which is, uh, again, they, they did by setting a couple of global variables. Um, and also some code patches in VM map enter and VM uh, map protect, which is um, uh, that should have been VM fault enter, sorry, which is um, which is basically uh, the entry points at which um, code signing at the time would um, uh, uh, you know examine pages and decide whether they're allowed to be mapped in or not. Lastly, they would remount the the root file system with read write access, uh, which uh, basically back then involved um, patching. Uh, a partition array in one of the kernel extensions. Uh, for stage five, um, uh, again, the root file system back then was read-only, but um, it wasn't really protected once you had tasks for PID zero. So uh, in, in, in their persistence strategy, basically what they did is they replaced a system binary with another Apple-signed binary called JSC. Um, this is a, a JavaScript core command line tool, which is sort of a developer and debugging tool uh, that um, Apple considered trusted at the time. And essentially, uh, it's, it's essentially the JavaScript engine from, from, uh, from WebKit, from Safari, except that um, uh, it also has uh, some debugging-like features. And uh, uh, as a result of being a developer tool, the code was subject to much less uh, security scrutiny, so it had some uh, a lot, a lot easier bugs than than the actual JSC engine that's in WebKit. So basically, they would replace uh, a binary, one of the startup binaries on on disk with uh, the JSC binary. Um, they can essentially then run a JavaScript uh, file at boot. They would exploit a vulnerability that they found in a in a function called set impure getter delegate, um, and then that was a, a type confusion, much like the other one. Uh, and then um, uh, exploit uh, similarly to how they exploited the other one. It should be noted that the JSC binary also has the run unsigned code entitlement. So again, by exploiting this, this is a very attractive target because you don't have to get around uh, code signing. So that's essentially how um, they did it back then. I, a lot of things have changed since Pegasus. Um, iOS 10, 11, and 12 have added in a lot of new protections in various different areas. And um, uh, I've gone over a lot of those protections. Um, there's been some level of kernel heap hardening, the Safari uh, JIT uh, hardening, um, the Safari Giga Cage, uh, and then KTRR introduction of the Apple file system, and of course, uh, the PMAP protected layer, PPL, and pointer authentication, which is uh, the things I talked about in the first section. Um, many of these mitigations have been talked about at length in the past, and if you want to learn the ma machinery of how they all work, um, Luca Tedesco uh, did a really good talk uh, last year, and I've put a link up there. Um, the new mitigations with A12 have not been talked about a great deal um, because they're new, but um, 
they are going to be talked about at length over the, over the next year. Um, I'm sure uh, Black Hat is going to be full of, of talks about these mitigations. Having said that, there's a little bit of discussion available online. Um, there's a really good uh, PAC uh, discussion um, by Brendan Azad at Project Zero uh, that I put a link to there. And um, there's a very brief overview of PPL um, uh, available at the link I've put there. Um, PPL has been barely mentioned at all in public and um, is an interesting area for further research. So the biggest changes in the post-Pegasus world are um, Safari exploit mitigations refinements, which affect our stage one. Uh, Safari sandbox is always getting tightened, uh, restricting your ability to do kernel exploits uh, uh, or to reach uh, vulnerable kernel code. Um, uh, kernel exploit mitigation refinements and uh, runtime integrity mitigations. Um, at this point in the speech, I discovered about SmartArt in PowerPoint, and uh, I thought it looked way better than point, uh, slides, so basically all the rest of my slides look awesome. <laughs> um, actually, I found out about it back here. Um, so uh, with Safari hacking, um, I've gone through most of these already, but uh, iOS 10 introduced um, uh, the, dual, uh, uh, the dual mapping, um, went from the dual mapping thing to uh, the uh, fast permission switching, which became a thing in iOS 11. Um, again, uh, this is to prevent the strategy, exactly the strategy that Pegasus used, which is get a, you know, uh, run a JavaScript function a lot of times to get it entered into the JIT, find the pointer to the JIT code, and then, and then just um, overwrite the destination with whatever code you want. This is a very common strategy, and so these JIT mitigations are intended to make that more difficult. Um, so that complicates the arbitrary execution stage. Um, the Giga Cage and is uh, an isolated uh, heap mitigation that got added in, um, in iOS 11, uh, and this makes it very difficult to exploit uh, use after free vulnerabilities and type confusions and thing, things like that, um, particularly because it prevents you from being able to map essentially arbitrary data over you know, what was previously a data structure full of pointers. And um, when you can't do that, then your ability to exploit some of these vulnerabilities is, uh, is restricted. And then iOS 12, on the A12s at least, uh, prevents ROP with, um, with PAC. Um, there's been various kernel hardening mitigations. The most important one that I wanted to make sure I mentioned was um, uh, something I mentioned in passing in the first section, which is freeing to the wrong zone. Um, so essentially, uh, the way that the kernel API uh, works in, uh, in iOS, the kernel allocator API, is you would um, specify a size that you wanted to allocate in the allocation of something, and you would also specify it when you're freeing it, and it would use that size to decide what zone, it's, what zone it's going to go to in many cases. So um, essentially, um, uh, again, Stefan Esser has talked about the kernel heap in great detail, but um, uh, there's basically different areas of memory that are reserved for different sized uh, allocations. And so obviously, if you got, uh, say, a 16-byte block uh, accidentally freed to a, a 64, byte zone, uh, the next person that allocates a 64-byte allocation is going to get that 16-byte block back, and you can trigger that vulnerability to then uh, work it into an overflow and do something useful. Um, so they've eliminated that. Um, also, by, uh, also, as an exploitation technique, it was quite useful because uh, you know, if you overwrote a data structure and uh, such that you got, um, you, know, you override a pointer and get it freed to the wrong zone, then uh, you might be able to get it allocated into a different zone that you uh, weren't easily able to um, access before and then, and then um, do some memory corruption in that zone. Um, they also did a number of metadata heap hardening techniques, uh, which, uh, again, has been talked about at length, but more, more or less um, uh, moved uh, metadata out of the actual zone and uh, into its own uh, isolated zone. Um, runtime integrity is the thing that I think um, has changed the most uh, in the last few years. 
Remember the first goal of a jailbreak is to compromise the runtime, and that took four stages to do. Pre-iOS 9, runtime integrity was completely undermined once you got task for PID 0. Basically, once you got read and write access to kernel memory, you can patch the kernel, you can run arbitrary kernel code, um, you can change page permissions, you can do anything you want. You, and, and that would also imply that you could run arbitrary user mode code because you could modify the trust cache, which is used to validate um, uh, you know, system binaries, so you could add your own. Um, so you could run any binary you want. You could remove code signatures. You could replace them. You could inject entitlements, all that kind of thing. Apple is trying to address this shortcoming quite aggressively. Um, and this is the sort of environment preservation stuff that I was kind of talking about in the first section. So um, this is another awesome smart art, by the way. Um, so basically, um, with the A9, is, uh, the, and iOS 9 is where they started, um, uh, started trying to do this. Um, uh, and, that, and the first attempt was with uh, kernel patch protection, which again was a hypervisor type technology that would uh, infrequently validate uh, parts of the kernel and cause a panic if uh, any of the kernel code had been modified. Um, so this was a problem, but you could sort of work around it by temporary patching, which is what a lot of jailbreaks sort of did. Um, there was also a couple of uh, bypasses um, that have been published. In particular, uh, Pangu mentioned one of them in a talk that I, that I gave a link to earlier. The A10 uh, then changed that and, um, and introduced an, a new feature called uh, Kernel Text Read Only Region, or KTRR, which is uh, intended to replace KPP. Um, this one uh, a, was a, a much more... Um, a much more complete solution. Um, you could basically set up a kernel region in memory uh, at early boot, and then say, OK, this can, never be, this can never be written to from now on. And so the kernel text and uh, the text segment and executable code uh, basically can't be modified after that. Um, and so basically, that was a real problem, because it essentially means that even with task for PID0, you can't execute kernel code anymore, and you have to rely on kernel ROP, which is uh, not very nice. Um, and then the A12s, which came out uh, just late last year in September, they uh, took this one step further um, and added PAC. And um, uh, this now means that not only can you not do kernel ROP, even if you've got full read-write access to kernel memory, um, but you need a, by a PAC bypass enabled to even do kernel ROP. Um, so this uh, makes it really difficult to ac actually execute any code uh, in the context of the kernel. Um, the other thing is injecting into user mode uh, is, is also now quite difficult because you can't easily run unsigned code because the critical data structures uh, managing you know, uh, the code signatures and page tables and things like that are now protected by the PPL region. Um, which uh, even, if, uh, even if you could ROP, um, you, uh, you can't uh, just arbitrarily modify the kernel data structures that you need to. You need to find a bypass in PPL. You, you basically need to find an entry point, a defined entry point in PPL that will allow you to uh, you know, um, modify the trust cache or do arbitrary um, uh, code manipulation. So this is our solution. I don't know what you guys are going to do, but I'm just going to ask Cyril and Tajay for the answer for bypassing PAC. Um, so if you look at uh, how Pegasus worked, and Pegasus was only two years old, the structural changes that Apple have made have really um, significantly impacted how a jailbreak might work. They used to um, gain code execution just writing to the JIT. Now they have to worry about bulletproof JIT to get around that. Um, they used to do a vtable overwrite, which is effectively mitigated by PAC. Um, they, have, they previously installed ROP um, backdoors to get started. Again, PAC is a problem there. Um, when they're weakening the, uh, the controls for the system, they um, did multiple kernel patches, uh, now no longer an option because of KTRR. Re remounting the file system, they have to get around the APFS integrity uh, stuff. And um, to backdoor any user mode processes, they now need a PPL bypass. Um, and the other thing worth noting is that JSC has been removed from Apple's trust cache, which means it's no longer considered um, a trusted binary, uh, much to the chagrin of uh, 
many jailbreakers. So if you look at the iOS 9 uh, jailbreak, it, it was a difficult uh, task. You needed Safari, possibly a sandbox escape, kernel, maybe KPP bypass and persistence. But if you compare it to what we have today, you need to do all of those things, plus a bulletproof JIT bypass, a user mode pack bypass, potentially, a kernel mode pack bypass, potentially, PPL bypass, and APFS remounting bug uh, in order for persistence. So in summary, um, it's always been a, a difficult task to uh, jailbreak an iPhone. But um, in particular, uh, with the recent mitigations, especially the A12, um, a full compromise of the ecosystem is, is really difficult. Um, uh, you know, often you're confined to, confined to ROP and don't have the ability to do unconstrained code execution. Um, and uh, even then, PAC and PPL, uh, once they have matured a little further, are going to represent um, a very significant bar barrier to even doing that. So I think in the future, we're going to likely see uh, increasingly relying on data-only attacks, um, programming weird machines and things like that. And I expect in turn that Apple will uh, have newer mitigations that will uh, expand on this by verifying data structure integrity um, uh, and you know, making sure that you can't modify critical data structures or that they detect and panic or something along those lines. So that's the end of my talk. Um, thanks for listening. And if anyone has any questions, I can take them now. <laughs>